area of ethics here at Villanova. One important way in which we plan to respond to that desire is to invite scholars in the field of ethics to Villanova in the fall of each year to offer a public lecture and an opportunity to interact with our faculty and students. So earlier today, our guest sat down with several faculty members to talk about the moral obligations of professors. A very interesting topic, I'm sure. We always talk about the moral obligations of students, but we rarely talk about the moral obligations of professors. So be before I introduce our speaker, I just want to remind everyone that while this lecture will be wonderful, I'm sure, the question and answer period afterward often clarifies what might have been a bit confusing, and it also offers the possibility for watching a scholar think on his or her feet. Always an inspiring experience. So I say that to all of you, just to ask you to respect the time of our scholar by participating in the Q&A afterward. Please turn off all your cell phones, or at least to mute them. And uh, please limit your texting during that, because I, or your Twitter, unless you're Twittering about the lecture. Um, or tweeting, I should say, not tweeting. Although it sounds like Twitter, but anyway. Um, so the event is being videotaped as well, and will be available for viewing on the Ethics Program website as soon as possible. So it's now my pleasure to welcome Professor William F. May to deliver the first ethics lecture here at Villanova University. Professor May received his PhD from Yale and taught for many years at Southern Methodist University, where he was the Carrie M. McGuire Professor of Ethics until his retirement in May 2001. He was the founding director of the Carrie M. McGuire Center for Ethics and Public Responsibility at SMU. And prior to arriving at SMU, Professor May was on the faculty at Indiana University and instrumental in initiating the doctoral program in religion, the same doctoral program at which our own Professor Mark Wilson earned his PhD. In September 2007, he was appointed to the McGuire Chair in American History and Ethics at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. While he is best known for his work in medical ethics in the last 15 years or so, Professor May has turned his attention to larger political and cultural questions, represented by the lecture he will give today. He has published numerous journal articles, as well as given conference papers throughout the world. I want to highlight three books that Professor, Penn has, that Professor May has penned since the year 2000. In 2001, he published Beleaguered Rulers, The Public Obligation of the Professional. In 2004, Testing the Medical Covenant, Active Euthanasia and Health Care Reform. And in 2011, last year, Testing the National Covenant, Fears and Appetites in American Politics. I am so pleased that Professor May has come to our campus to spend some time with us and to share with us the fruits of his lifetime of reflection on issues that have never been more timely. This afternoon, Professor May will address us in a lecture entitled, The Bearing of Religion on Fears and Appetites in American Politics. The subtitle is a quote from the American writer Flannery O'Connor, you know a people by the stories they tell. So please help me give Professor May a hearty <clears throat> Thank you for your very gracious introduction, and uh, there, I hope to have time for questions. You can also, at that time, throw cabbages, you know, in the form of adversarial uh, remarks if you, if you have them to make. So uh, keep all that in mind. I am an ethicist, and that word does not come trippingly to the tongue. Uh, some of my wife's friends in the, the uh, theater have referred to me as an, an anesthetist, though I don't uh, put people to sleep, at, at least not uh, deliberately. Um, I'm going to talk about politics, but I have to emphasize I do it as an ethicist. Uh, I was once giving a lecture at uh, Northwestern University, and I, I gave it on ethics. It was at the business school, 
uh, but I gave it on business ethics, and she said, well, uh, Professor May, would you mind, if, would you stand back from business ethics and just tell uh, us how you would define ethics? And uh, I said, well, uh, I once had to do that for a group of ophthalmologists, and I defined ethics as corrective vision. You can see why I'd come up with that uh, definition of it, because most of your education is spent in describing what is, how the body works, how the uh, economic system works, how the political system works, and so forth. But uh, ethics does raise the question not simply what is, but what ought to be. It is a question of corrective vision. And uh, I said, of course, uh, opportunist that I am, had I been talking to a group of cardiologists, I would have said that ethics is also a matter of uh, the heart and the will. Because you can know what you should do, but yet you don't do it. Our name for that in religious circles is temptation. Our name for that outside of religious circles is rationalization. And we do that almost every day with every time we say, I did this because, and we engage busily in rationalizing in order to true up what we have to say with people that we're talking to. Well, I felt I had um, said, all right, ethics is corrective vision. Ethics is a matter of having your heart in the right place. I got out of the question. Then there was a doer fellow on that side of the auditorium who said, uh, Professor May, would you mind defining ethics for us if you were talking to a group of proctologists? <laughs> and I said, well, if I were talking to a group of proctologists, I would say that ethics is a matter of the pursuit of ends. The pursuit of the right end and the right pursuit of the ends. Well, that was uh, a high point of the afternoon uh, for me. Uh, not the lecture, but the question afterwards. Uh, though I can't guarantee I will be that resourceful in answering questions today. I'm talking about politics but not the way people usually do it if they're talking about the bearing of religion on politics, because what usually you get is uh, somebody uh, banding the legs of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, and today uh, Buddhists uh, and Muslims, and see how they behave uh, in the ballot box. And that's normally what one expects. One is thinking about institutional religion. But it is my effort in this book that I did call Testing the National Covenant, Fears and Appetites in American Politics, not to deal with um, official religious traditions and how members of those traditions may behave politically, but rather to look at the at religion embedded in politics itself. Because there's an awful lot of religious passion at work in our politics today that doesn't simply uh, reflect deductively classical Catholicism, classical Protestantism, and so forth. But it nevertheless, in so many ways, drives the discussion in America right now. And so that's what I wanted to do. Well, if I really wanted to do that, to deal with religion as it embeds itself in the politics, then I was, uh, would find help from somebody who comes out of the tradition that many of you represent here, I guess a lot of you are Catholics, a lot of you are not. It's a, a large university. Such universities are not merely private because you have a public function as a university. You're open to a range of 
publics and constituencies as you uh, do what you do here. But I was helped by a remark by Flannery O'Connor, the, uh, the wonderful uh, Catholic novelist. And she said, and it was used in the title that I gave in advance of coming here, you know a people by the stories they tell. You know a people by the stories they tell. The novelist had in mind not fictions in the sense of untrue or made up stories, but myths. That is stories in which people recognize themselves and their world. Myths are narratives so deeply true that people repeat them and act them out. Myths order expectations and mold sensibilities. They shape people cognitively and morally, both. Cognitively, a myth, a narrative, a story of the order that I am talking about Cognitively, they give a people their vision of the world and themselves and others, and morally, they cue them in, telling them how to behave in the light of their perceptions. They assign them their duties towards themselves and towards others. Think of the Horatio Alger myth. It's a story of a young man triumphing on his own resources. And the myth carries with it moral consequences. If that's the way you do it, on your own, through your own determination and resource and ability and dedication, well, then other people are also on their own. And it might be corrupting to tax for their benefit because they're on their own. Or it might even be corrupting to engage in philanthropy because you don't want to have a dependency relationship, you see. The Horatio Alger myth gives people a sense of themselves and the world in which they find themselves and gives them their cues for behavior at a moral and indeed a political level. Now, it was long said before it became up recently in the religious debates. There's another way of putting it in the uh, political debates recently. He said, we're in this together. It's a very different view that has been reiterated in recent politics dealing with the debates between Republicans and Democrats and whatnot today. I was helped with regard to this second understanding. We're in it together by a wonderful uh, graduation lecture given at the Harvard Medical School by a guy named Judah Goldman. Uh, uh, Feldman, excuse me, it was Feldman. And uh, he said, if you've zigzagged your way through a college and a medical school and so forth, you cannot think yourself as a self-made man or a self-made woman. You have depended upon the teachers who have taught you. You depend upon the research traditions that allowed that teacher to be smart enough to teach you. You tended, you had depended upon the janitors who take care of the Johns, the secretaries who do the scut work for uh, a large institution. That's a dismissive term with use. I was appalled to hear a dean say he would like to hire somebody that I had on a faculty that I had responsibility for. He said, well, we want her to do the donkey work uh, for uh, this particular uh, graduate school. I was very annoyed by that way of putting it. 
There are a whole series of dependencies that allow you to become the person that you become. And it is foolish to go through an institution and now think of yourself by some mysterious act of parthenogenesis having appeared in the world, now free in your career to do as you please, no questions asked. A college education, a university education, gives you a knowledge-based power. And the teachers are defective in their responsibility if they shovel out all the knowledge without raising questions about its uh, uh, responsible uses. So, Myths and stories are what I'm talking about. Now, the stories we tell ourselves today, I'm gonna to turn first to foreign policy, because I said I'm gonna turn now to politics, but try to deal with the myths that get embedded in our politics. Uh, and I'll start first with uh, foreign policy. And a foreign policy as it gets driven by runaway fear. That's been one of the problems that America has had to face uh, since World War II. We won that war, but since then we faced, of course, the threat of uh, Soviet Union, and then the more recent threat of uh, terrorism, you see. And both arouse in various ways uh, in this country uh, anxiety and fear. Well, let me submit to you that the radical right has reflected a practical religious dualism driven by fear in its pressures on foreign policy, uh, first during the Cold War. It recounted the mythic struggle of absolute good versus absolute evil. The kingdom of God pitted against the kingdom of Satan. Capitalism versus communism. It's a dualist religious vision, you see. And a story that traces all the way back to the Manichaean dualists of the ancient world. And this dualist narrative maintains its hold on the human psyche, not simply on those guys out there. It sounds as though I simply said, well, they're wrong and they're evil. Well, that would be a Manichaean attitude towards Manichaeans. Because um, a dualist narrative gets inside of us and in all of us. Um, it maintains its hold, not through historic transmission. You haven't got a church that dates back directly to the ancient Manichaean dualists. Nobody goes to that kind of institution wittingly as an historical transmission. But it is, appeals to something deep in the human psyche of us versus them. The organization of a corporation is usually pyramidal. You know, that's hierarchical and pyramidal. But within the operation of the, hist uh, the uh, corporation, a kind of informal dualism can develop of us versus them. Your patron and your prospect of growth in the company as opposed to somebody else, other line, or within a given office, this person steps on my corns and I now quickly uh, organize my set of friends. Dualism is not simply transmitted from the ancient Manichaean dualists. It is a deep temptation within the human psyche itself. And that's why, no matter what you say about dualists, be careful that you don't become now a dualist in your attitudes towards the dualist, because there's another religious tradition, monotheism, that doesn't divide the righteous from the unrighteous, 
those committed to absolute good against those committed against absolute evil. But the tradition of which we are all a part, maybe in this room, all are children of God. All, without exception, cannot be understood apart from the one God. Religious dualism is embedded in various ways in American politics, but there is the alternative tradition, the alternative story of monotheism that moves in another direction. And indeed, it is impossible to sustain a healthy politics uh, simply in dualist terms because it chronically tempts any society that wearies of the complexities and compromises of politics and seeks to substitute for politics the apparent clarities of battle. That's what a Manichaean outlook tends to do, because there's no way of compromising with the other party. They are already identified with what you consider evil, and that would be a sign of weakness on your part if you engaged in it. And it would mean that you had not honored the absolute distinction in the human arena itself of good and evil. Well, the rise of terrorism signaled a second kind of religious dualism, again driven by fear. This time, not order versus malevolent order, that's the way the ancient Manichaean, kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. Both orders are organized. One absolute good, the other absolute evil. But terrorism stirs another kind of fear in the modern world, because uh, we're talking about here, not order versus malevolent order, but order versus chaos the political term for which is anarchy. The narrative in this case echoes the Babylonian creation myth, an account of a cosmic struggle between two rival gods, Marduk, a kind of sheriff deity, an enforcer of law and order, who kills Tiamat, a formless, she happened to be uh, to be a female monstrous figure who issues from the turbulent waters, waters being the symbol of chaos, you see. Marduk fashions the world we know out of Tiamat's dismembered body, and thus the world that we know and the creatures we are, at the same time, participate in both order and chaos. Well, the ancient myth expressed a dread of chaos through the image of floods that engulf and overwhelm all structures and forms. And it came out of what is now today, uh, of course, Iraq, that area, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and the periodic flooding of the two great rivers of Mesopotamia may have inspired the ancient story. And in our time, we experience the shudder of chaos recently in Babylon itself and on our own Gulf Shores after Hurricane Katrina and in the successive breakdowns of our economic and political systems. So after World War II, the dominant operating foreign policy problem was the temptation to see things entirely in terms, dualist terms, of good order versus evil order. Since the emergence of uh, terrorism, that's not simply a 20th century phenomenon, it's there in the 19th century as well, on occasion. But more recently, it's not order versus malevolent order, 
but it has rather been the threat of chaos, the breakdown of the ability to fight uh, the terrorists. Why the breakdown of the ability to fight? Because the terrorist is not afraid of dying. Not afraid of dying. And if we have justified our politics on the basis of the power of the state to protect us against death, then we depend upon the state to keep us alive. But now suddenly, outside of the system, you face an enemy who is not apparently afraid of death. Order versus chaos was the fundamental primordial apprehension and fear that tended to uh, get uh, powerful uh, as an alternative in American politics. In the West, both forms of dualism have nested persistently in the three monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. However, these three Abrahamic traditions differ from dualism. They affirm one God, not two, and recognize that all human beings, friends as well as foes, fall short of God's glory. It isn't they are with God and I am with the devil, or vice versa, but we all fall short of the glory of God. Furthermore, evil is real, Monotheism doesn't wipe out the reality of evil, but it says evil is not ultimate. So you somehow get your life askew if you obsess only on the enemy in your life. There's a fundamental distortion of human existence that goes if you uh, simply obsess on the one uh, you want to defeat. However, the language of monotheism, God versus Satan, and it's there in the biblical tradition, is susceptible to a melodramatic reordering that inflates the devil into God's co-equal and organizes believers obsessively into a fight against evil equated with their enemies. Political movements that are effectively dualistic have aggressively sought support from adherence of traditional monotheistic faiths. Now there we face a complication today, you see. Monotheism is different from these traditions, but on the other hand, the language is there in both traditions. You get a subtle, sudden changes. You make the devil co-equal to God, and at practical levels, you organize your life not in relationship to God, but rather to this threatening power that begins increasingly to define your life, and by the way, to define political budgets as well. Now, dualism generally inspires a foreign policy of either first apart from others. And that was a very early impulse in American life. It was known as the Monroe Doctrine. Don't get involved in entangling alliances, you see. That is the, uh, the suspect Europe, for those who weren't black, they came to get away from that. So we don't want to get entangled with this morally discredited society. It's the ethics of withdrawal. The notion of primus uh, sine uh, uh, Give me the word. It's not partes, because that would be equals. Without others. Let's get back to English. To be without others. And that is the impulse of isolationism in American policy. And it was very powerful, particularly 
uh, in Protestant traditions in the 1930s. Stay away from Europe. It's bad medicine. Don't get entangled in the difficulties that were emerging uh, in Europe. Okay, the second possibility is not first apart from others. The second is the first over others. And if you saw isolationism in the 1930s as a very major problem that uh, Roosevelt, who felt that we ought to be engaged in what was happening in Europe, uh, after World War II, we were involved in winning war, and then we began to move towards the notion of the American century. First over others. And uh, you got that more recently in uh, the neoconservative movement. Uh, there's a wonderful article uh, written uh, about the United States should not be a reluctant sheriff. We live in a unipolar world. America has a res responsibility over others in dealing either with the unrighteous tyrant or uh, the threatening uh, forces of chaos. And that uh, leaves only one other possibility in foreign policy that makes sense to me. It's not the first apart from others or the first over others, but the first with others. Primus inter pares, I guess, is the way uh, that would be uh, described in the old Latin phrase. And uh, that's uh, periodically, irregularly, not uh, smoothly at all, because in American foreign policy, there's a constant debate between these two options, engaging in a titanic battle against the Soviets, or ruling over the world and the sources of oil and everything uh, through our own power, my way or the highway, or third, uh, the question that says we should be thinking more in terms of the uh, first amongst e uh, equals. Now, um, <clears throat> on these issues, I'm an outsider to the field, but who made sense to me was uh, George Kennan. He said the appropriate relationship to the Soviets, he wasn't saying that they're good, he wasn't naively sentimental about them, but we should adopt a policy of containment, he said. You need to contain the bully, but not become a bully yourself in the process of dealing with the bully. Well, if you hold to this view, then you realize uh, that uh, George Kennan, and I went back to those famous essays that he wrote in 1947, 1948, uh, he made it uh, very clear. If you adopt a policy of containment, the first order of business is to contain yourself. Don't solve the problem of the Soviet empire by becoming an empire yourself. So America needed to contain its fears if it would win at a deeper level of long-term identity as well as at the level of its status of before God. Um, that is, it seems to me, uh, what is worth um, uh, keeping in mind. Now, um, Second question is domestic policy. Taking a look at domestic policy. Um, following 9-11, the President of the United States Council of the Nation get down to Disney World in Florida. Take your families and enjoy life the way we want it to be enjoyed. Go shopping. Don't worry about taxes. <laughs> 
um, this is your president speaking, because the, the war wasn't paid for. We're not going to tax you to pay for the war. Go shopping was the, uh, the point that he made. We aren't going to pay for the war on my watch. Well, this advice was hardly surprising in a consumerist culture driven by runaway appetites. My parallel here is runaway fears in foreign policy, but runaway appetites in domestic policy. And in a society where the prevailing teaching authority is not the school system, but the television set. If you know a people by the stories they tell, well, uh, today, uh, Flannery O'Connor would see that what floods our time is story after story about the products that will enhance you, that will lead you to a richer, fuller, and so forth life. So uh, when we were told, uh, get down to Disney World and enjoy yourself, it was a, a view that would appeal to a, uh, a society driven by its appetites. And uh, that has been the chronic problem in domestic, pro in, in domestic policy for Americans. Runaway appetites have tended to drive the decisions of ordinary consumers for cars, houses, food, mortgages, and reckless domestic debts, and to spur the ambitions of those living above tree line, um, where they feel the need and compulsion to acquire yet more in the way of bonuses, stock options, leveraged buyouts, tax havens, sweet deals, and golden parachutes, until at length the market's dizzying ride led to the crash of 2007-2009. The economic crisis produced a dramatic shift from heedless prodigality to anxious frugality. From a paroxysm of appetite to the paralysis of fear. And the economist John Maynard Keynes, he's parallel to George Kennan. If George Kennan said, to contain what we face in foreign policy, you have to engage in self-containment, curb your runaway fears, and don't stupidly uh, aspire to be an empire first over all others. To remain an American republic requires a different response than that. Then in domestic policy, I at least found some help in John Maynard Keynes. He sought to contain and restrain such damaging rampages in appetites and fears on the domestic scene. Way back in the 20s and the 30s, he proposed a counter-cyclical fiscal policy that will contain runaway desire in good times. It's important to contain your desire in good times. We've got biblical stories, the seven, uh, seven cat, uh, fat uh, cows and the seven lean cows. This is old wisdom indeed. So he proposed a counter-cyclical fiscal policy that would contain runaway desire in good times partly through taxes, uh, and uh, then uh, in bad times, you need to invest. You need uh, to have a government engage. The government doesn't fade. It has a responsibility in good times to tax and regulate and it has a responsibility in bad times when people are frozen in fear to begin to stimulate the economy, and that requires some deficit spending. And there's a huge debate over this issue. But I hope I've carried this far enough for you to see that there is really a question of religious passions and patterns at work 
in the po political discourse of our time. And you may notice, therefore, a resemblance here between canons, emphasis on the importance of self-containment in foreign policy, and Keynes' recognition of the need for a disciplined counter-cyclical fiscal policy to help a nation uh, counter its dangerous market swings in appetites and fears. And we're not at the end of that one yet. Now, the title of the book, Testing the National Covenant, suggests another story line about our national identity that bears on the task of curbing runaway fears and appetites. And I would associate that with the notion of a contract and a covenant. Now, a bit of background here. The book identifies four basic ways of interpreting American identity. Unnatural, natural, contractual, and covenantal. And I'll spend time only on the last two. By unnatural identity, think of the rape of Europa. How did a country come into being? How did an area come into being? Through violence, through abusive power and force. That's the myth of Europa. Well, in our country, only Native Americans, African Americans, and some Hispanics suffered the violent or unnatural imposition of identity by conquest or enslavement. That's the first kind of identity. It hasn't been dominant in America, not for the majority. It was there as a problem for significant minorities. Second, the concept of a natural identity highlights those properties human beings share in common that transcend any differing characteristics based on race, culture, or custom. And we get that out of monotheism and particularly important in the Catholic tradition the notion of natural law, what we all share in common as human beings. Whatever the benefits of this universalism, Roman Catholics, its chief religious bearers, were insufficiently numerous or powerful at the nation's founding to shape the country's sense of itself. You know enough about the history of the Catholic Church in this country. I come on one side of my family through Poles. They came to this country when there was need for labor in Chicago, and that was part of the huge migration to this country of 1890 to 1910. But this was much later that the Catholic influence in this country had a sheer number of uh, a sheer quantity of people in order to make them powerfully felt. Further, the obvious diversity in the origins of European immigrants made it difficult to claim an American identity based on a common human nature. Think about that one. We seem to be one out of many. That became our slogan, did it not? One out of many. We weren't one by nature or blood. We come out of many sources and eventually became a nation. So my book, my thinking on this, focused on the two remaining contending myths for understanding our national, uh, natural identity. A contractualist understanding of government. That's the one that most people talk about. The Constitution of the United States is a contract. And those who take this line on it, they begin with the defense of a strictly limited government to protect individuals' lives and properties against the negative threats of fire, theft, murder, fraud, and foreign invasion. 
Well, that's fine and good, but it has one serious problem to it. The government has a negative function to allow you to sleep through the night without being murdered or having your possession stripped, you see. But that justification of government doesn't necessarily remain small because you begin to obsess on threats. And so you unjustify the police and the military budgets. We didn't pay for the invasion in Iraq. Uh, but it was justified in terms of this protection against threat. What you begin to lose is that other thing that appears in the Constitution, and now I'm appealing to the Constitution to talk about a different view of that document. It talks not simply about peace and tranquility and security. It talks about the general welfare. The government has not simply a negative function to protect you from an evil, runaway evils, you see, but it has a positive function to support and aid and abet the general welfare. And so we tend to get from one side in the political religious spectrum this notion that government will say stay small, but in fact, if you constantly justified it in terms of its protection against a negative, in fact, that is the power of government that grows uh, inordinately. By the way, I think it also uh, influences something like healthcare. Since World War II, we have uh, seen very little growth in the support of education. At the end of World War II, education received about four and a half to five percent of the national budget. It doesn't receive a heck of a lot more than that today. But healthcare has jumped from that same figure all the way up to 18%. So the fear of disease and death is not simply the military, but the organization of your healthcare system itself around the fight against disease and death that has led to this growth of uh, uh, those features of government that are defined in terms of a military fight of conquest. Now, it has difficulty curbing fears, a contractual understanding. You got a government, simply you contract for it in order to protect you. You leave out its further responsibilities. It also has difficulties in dealing with uh, runaway uh, appetites. The government comes into being solely through the individual's interest in resisting impositions upon itself, imposing is a supreme evil. Government, at best, is a necessary evil. And therefore, you begin to say, if you'd indulge in support for the general welfare in any form and fashion, you're engaged in mission creep. And so you pare away all of those other responsibilities that issue from that basic uh, myth. We're in this together. We're in this together. And we foolishly understand ourselves if we think we simply make it on our own. Government has a role of entitlement, to be sure, that I would agree to. It also, in, uh, citizenship has a role of not simply entitlement, but duties. We have, uh, the Romans talked about entitlements, general welfare and those entitlements. That word entitlement has gotten a bad uh, meaning today. But if you get an education, it's not simply part of an entitlement, it is also your duty to cooperate with it. Get yourself educated. It, two sides to it. And if one was the Roman understanding of government, the other was the Athenian understanding of government. Um, 
A covenantal understanding of your life is not simply one in which you think of what I will get out of a deal. A covenant is a little bit more like, uh, like uh, let's say, entering into a marriage and say, well, I just read an article that says, I'll live longer if I marry you, because married people live longer than single people. You're talking about a bond that is deeper, broader in character. And Lincoln once said, you know, uh, the union of which we're a part is just like a marriage. It includes not simply buying and selling, that's a contract, but giving and receiving, and also being open to the future. One interesting problem in the interpretation of the Supreme Court is this lack of openness towards our future. If you cannot nail down specifically this particular piece of legislation, so the originalists are saying, you have no responsibility to it. Well, I couldn't lay down in the contract what my responsibilities were to my children, because to be a parent means to be open to the unexpected. To be married means to be open to the unexpected. To be the citizen of a country like this is to be open to the unexpected. In the last chapter of the book simply says also, openness to the stranger. And that's that huge issue before us today, immigration policy. And I'll remind you simply in closing that the commitment on Mount Sinai that the Jews made, it's very interesting that the slaves were present. They're called servants now in the translation, but effectively they were slaves. And later on, you'll get a God who says, I have heard the cry of the widow and the orphan, and so forth. We have responsibilities to the stranger in our midst. And that needs to be remembered by Americans because we are an immigrant nation, immigrants ourselves, but we constantly are faced with the problem of the tremor before the arrival of the stranger. Will he spoil the neighborhood? I remember when my first grandson was born uh, and his parents said, we're going to have another child. And uh, he said uh, to my son, Ted, why? Why spoil Eve, e Eden? And that's a constant problem in dealing with the strangers. How do you have a covenantal sense that is not simply tied by the this and that particular in the contract, but is open to the uncertainties of the future, including not only strangers identified as uh, foreigners in this country, but also in my own profession, teaching requires being open to the stranger, the kid in the classroom, because the ultimate immigrants in any society are not simply those who come in, but your own kids. It was called the generation gap. And how do you open up to the next generation and talk in ways that allow conversation to continue? But my oldest son once warned me, uh, well, I don't ask you enough questions, Dad, because you don't give me a yes or no answer. You give me a paragraph. And I've given you more than a paragraph today. Thank you. time for questions and, 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 and Professor May would like you to speak up um, um, so we can hear you. He's having a little difficulty hearing today. Okay. I, I lost my hearing well, I didn't want to get two weeks ago. <laughs> so project as though you were up here. <laughs> <laughs> 
came out to be self-made. But I just want to ask your role of choice, because yes, like there are students in the university and there are professors and TAs, but I just kind of want to hear your role of choice, because you know, there's 6,000 kids in this university, but that one kid still has to make a choice to see the professor outside of class and go on to graduate school and further along. You know, um, I didn't want to condemn the self-made. I just want to say there are two sides to it. There's the receiving and the giving. And uh, you need uh, the student as partner in the classroom uh, with you. I am a teacher, purportedly you're a giver, but I got into teaching because I knew it would allow me to remain a student. Because um, in teaching, I'm not just packaging what I already know, but there's a possibility of having to see the subject with the eyes of a stranger. And the next generation coming along your age uh, you're the strangers that I need in order to have this subject remain fresh for me. So, uh, at least in the humanities, I, I'll never forget the guy who did the uh, 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 Watson and Crick, you know, they, they had discovery of the, uh, uh, the chain. They, um, they wrote it up on a weekend. I was astounded because he was just packaging what they had discovered. But in the humanities and ethics and so forth, um, you don't package what you've already discovered. You have to see it from the vantage point of others, and therefore it is a heuristic act of discovery for you. So you give as a teacher, but you get back from your students remaining a student to stay alive professionally. And I, I think that happens in other professions. I think my two daughters who are physicians owe a lot to their teachers who taught them, but they also owe something to the patients who laid their bodies on the line to let them practice on them. Uh, that's, that's part of becoming a professional. Well, I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I get the use of the um, the myths in foreign policy, but I wasn't clear what the myths are with the appetites. I mean, I understand well, what you were saying about the oh, very quickly, I, I just uh, the constant repetition of advertising is a good illustration of that. What, how your life will be enhanced? But how is that religious? They're, is what I'm getting at. They're stories. How what is that religious? Because the other the, the notion of expansion beyond what you can be. You know, if I were talking about the successive teaching authorities in the West, the first was the church, saints, the second, the academy, heroes, uh, but the third was uh, the media. And what it offers is the enhancement of life. No deeds like the hero or the saint, but appearances. And we're enthralled with it. Now, the danger of all that, that we get from a consumerist society, the original was more aristocratic, and then you ended up with meritarian. Today, it is consumerist in orientation. And the notion that these are the things that will enrich you, fill out, give you a touch, if you will, of glory. And so, saint, hero, but now celebrity, because these are the masters of appearances.
Now, it has a danger that what you get in the society is enthusiasm for the celebrity figure and then undercut uh, or buyer's grief with regard to the product. I wanted this, I wanted it, and wanted it. When it became mine, oh geez, it's the same old me, the same old world, buyer's grief. So you oscillate between enthusiasm on the one hand and cynicism on the other hand. And uh, uh, that's a dangerous problem educationally. The problem in education in part is um, if the student ends up cynical, he's uneducable because he sits in a place that he cannot be moved by anything because he trashes the noble as well as the trivial. Catcher in the Rye was a wonderful statement on that problem. The notion of uh, bullshit in every d direction. It was a great statement of that. And uh, it differs from what criticism is in the setting of the university. Criticism it means the ability to make judgments between the noble and the trivial, the routine and the extraordinary, the bold and the timid and conventional. Criticism in the setting of the arts constant requires that uh, development of that sensibility. And if you develop that sensibility, then you quickly understand that the noble, the extraordinary text, requires even a transformation in your own life to, in order to be worthy of. Greatness cannot be measured, it must be lived up to, is what R.P. Blackmere said, and I mentioned that at lunch. I thought that was a wonderful statement. If any of you read Moby Dick, you'll notice he's got a chapter on how big that whale was and he measures it this way and that way and he ends up saying, throws away all these measurements and says, it's immeasurable. And that was a, a great way um, I find in life that the artist has a difficulty talking about either transcendent evil or transcendent good. Uh, transcendent evil, you tend to make the, uh, the show uh, of melodrama. You don't have the language to make clear to a society what the horror was of the Holocaust. But even worse is at the top, artists also fail in uh, conveying an immensity that is beyond our grasp. And we, we did this in you know, getting the figure of the saint and then the halo as a suggestion that what you've got here is an extraordinary human virtue, but it points to something beyond it that cannot simply be trapped and it cannot be measured, it must be lived up to. Yeah? I want to go back to the uh, first question that was asked about um, uh, self, the self, the sort of self-starter uh, idea. I know that uh, the concept of autonomy has been really important in medical ethics. I'm curious whether you think that's a concept that um, needs to be replaced with something that attends better to this idea that we're all in it together? Or is it mainly something that just needs to be balanced out with some other concepts? Yeah, I, I, I cer certainly uh, did not fully uh, honor the, the question. Self-starting is, is crucial, but oftentimes we need the assist of those who are present to us in a way that elicits starting from us. 
we're both self-starting as though it comes out of nothing isn't quite what usually happens, it seems to me. It means sometimes where persons have gone through great difficulties, uh, and that's what people in the helping professions, the kid comes out of a rotten family at the level of just getting him going, or a rotten peer group. And then you've got a person who stirs the imagination of what might be. Self-starting usually requires some kind of stirring the imagination that suggests it isn't simply ex nihilo, out of nothing, uh, without any prompting whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you talk about isolation, isolationism in respect to dualism. Um, and I was wondering if you thought that, ethically speaking, our leaders at that time thought that America was the only absolute good, and so it wasn't worth um, meddling in other countries uh, in regards to alliances and such. Is, is, that, is that what that only absolute good meant uh, for our politicians in regards to absolute, uh, isolationism? Uh, you better say that last point a little uh, louder for me. Um, like, did, did you think that our leaders at that time, when they put the Monroe Doctrine into place, thought that America was the only absolute good, and that why, that's why it's not worth meddling in other countries' alliances? We are the only absolute good? Right. Yeah, I mean, that may have related to the whole problem of exceptionalism. Is that what you're talking yeah, about in a way? Yeah, concept in regards to why yeah. isolationism into effect. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about the city on a hill, it's attributed to Reagan, but Reagan, it's from scripture, as you, as you know, the passage on the city on the hill. There are a couple of ways of understanding that. One is as command center. The city on the hill, in some societies, that's where you put the city to be the command center, radiating out from that. And the other is the, uh, a city on the hill that uh, offers an example that may be helpful. The light shining on a hill. There are two different ways of understanding that, that sitting on a hill. So it isn't the case. I mean, that also has an exceptionalist element to it. You know, it implies darkness out there and you got the city on the hill that gives you light and all that, it, it, it's, it's making a claim for America to be sure, but there's a world of difference between uh, leading by example, which by the way George Kennan talks about in those essays on foreign policy. He said, our relationship to the Soviets, it requires self-containment in order for us to remain what we are, a republic. And not saying, ah, here's this dominant world power now we should become uh, a rival world power that knocks out the first one. By the way, he also felt he saw good signs of eventual collapse for the Soviets. Uh, he, 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 remarkable forecasting of what happened. He didn't make that the only reason of why he suggested we needed, we needed to react to tyranny not by becoming a tyrant ourselves, but by remaining a republic. So American exceptionalism can take the form of the command center of the universe. It doesn't have to take that form. Yeah. <clears throat> My question actually is a bit of a follow-up with Jesse's. I, I'm thinking about much of your work in medical ethics and the way in which you negotiate the relationship between paternalism and autonomy. And I'm wondering how that sort of relationship maps for you the relationship between government and citizens, if there's any, if there's any correlation at all. Are you familiar? Who wrote the book that deals uh, the nudge? Uh, 
Have you, any of you read the book on the nudge? Uh, nudge? Uh, it suggests to get over paternalism and autonomy, you had to have people who have responsibility for helping things to become better, not simply flooding and oppressing and drawing the oxygen out of the room, to mix my metaphors. And I read through the book, but you have to arrange things in such a way that the proper choice comes into perspective and people can act on it. So you don't dominate, or you don't just say whatever, it's okay. And I hope you will not be uh, offended by my illustration from the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it in this life or the next. Uh, he talks about a, a, a society, a European society, that uh, arranged a latrine a latrine, and in the stall in the urinal, uh, inscribed in the uh, <clears throat> uh, a fly, and they did empirical analysis and found that people were more responsible in aiming the waste in the urinal with the fly there embedded in the center of the urinal. Well, it's a crude example, but not simply, well, you're doing it wrong, here's what's right, and don't do those other things any longer, but arrange things in such a way that the right choice uh, makes more sense. Uh, and that might work out. And I had uh, I had a friend at Smith College when I was teaching there. My son Ted never read, and I asked Bill Van Voris how he got his kid to read. They're in the same class, and I, I knew Ted was bright. And he said, "Well, Bill, my solution was very simple." I told him, under no circumstances, was he to read in bed, and then I bought him a good light. He <laughs> arranged things in such a way that a reading didn't come by homily, but circumstances opened up the opportunity. Well, that's a better illustration than the one given in the nudge. <laughs> In, in mixed company, I guess. <laughs> yes, sir. I wanted to go back to the last point that you made at the end of your lecture about sometimes at home, the foreigners being the own, your, own, your own students in the classroom sometimes. And um, I often find that at the university, it's so easy for students to communicate with each other. Um, but sometimes it's, it's so hard to communicate with people who are, who are you know, on the other side of the generation yet. And I wanted to know what you thought was the best way to build that bridge for communication between, and cooperation between the generations. And by generation gap, you're talking about your teachers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell a story that I, I if I sort it out, in trying to teach students how to write, I said, structurally, we set it up in a bad way. You're writing for us. Purportedly, we know more about the subject than you do. And so you develop a kind of shorthand, code language, uh, or ap appealing to the buzzword terms. So you think, well, it's a, course, and dealing with contract, covenant, con contract is this, covenant is that, and uh, giving back to the professor what he has given to you. Most of our writing is vertical and up. What real writing requires of you, and that's how people, by the way, got to be professors, 
They rode up in classes pretty well with their professors. They got the best grades. They got into graduate school. And eventually, they had a dissertation committee. And they wrote for this committee of three, the dissertation advisor and the PhD. And then they go out, and all their writing is up for the gatekeepers in the field, those who are above them. It may not be a full generation gap, but it is writing up. And I, I said uh, in a seminar with faculty members later on, it seems to me what is important to do is for them to learn how to write out and over, out and over to an intelligent audience of inquirers. That is, you will impress me as a teacher if you do a good job of teaching your peers. So ask, take my test, and answer the question as though the question had been asked by somebody who didn't take the course in order to make sense of what the answer requires. Teach what you know. Well, I did this with a faculty seminar at some institution. And um, a faculty member said, you know, when you were here uh, last year or the year before that, and I gave my students that instruction. In their exams and on the papers they wrote, I wanted to see them to run with it, with what they knew. Instead of this term, that term, and getting out. Didn't I say the right thing? Period. Out. Well, a faculty member said, I, I told students that I wanted to write uh, as though they were writing to some outside person who hasn't, uh, doesn't know anything about this subject. And he said, I got a letter from a father. He said, you know, my son wrote a paper in your course, which he formed in the form of writing me uh, a letter. And he said, I want you to know that's the only letter I got from him in which he didn't simply ask for money. <laughs> uh, so I would think it's important in learning how to write you remember that there's something artificial in the classroom. I'm not dismissing it, but you're writing up to an earlier generation above you. But in the course of life, as you move out, when you're forced to explain why this and not that, then you aren't simply expressing your preferences. You're offering your considered judgment. And that means organizing your reasons for it. And that's what it seems to me at the level of student to student contact uh, ought to be going on. But we haven't organized education in such a way. Too much writing is filial writing up and not out and over, which is collegial in character. So the question you raise, uh, at least, uh, uh, I find interesting. 